In this episode, we'll be talking about how co-design has the power to transform our society and the need for more sustainable design and how we lost it along the way. And here is the guest of this episode. I'm Hartmut Esslinger, uh, this is the Service Design Show. Hi guys, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome to a brand new episode of the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you to learn from the future of service design. We talk about topics ranging from design thinking and customer experience to organizational change and creative leadership. If these are the topics you're interested in, be sure to know that we bring you a new episode every two weeks on Thursday. So if you don't want to miss anything, click that subscribe button. And if you like to show your support, please leave a short comment or click that like button. It lets me know that the things we're doing here are appreciated by people like you. My guest in this episode is an absolute design legend. If you haven't heard of his name, open Google right now and go look for it. Hartmut Esslinger is the founder of Frog Design. He's worked with Apple since 1982 on the products they've been creating since then. Currently he is retired but also a professor at the Ditao Beijing Masters Academy, working a lot with design students in China. In the next 30 minutes or so, Hartmut will be talking about a lot of things, but especially these two. Why does co-design have the power to transform our society? And why we need more sustainable design and how did we lose it along the way? If you're interested in one of these topics and you want to fast forward, check out the episode guide down below in the description but I would strongly advise you to just keep watching throughout the whole interview. And if you're interested in listening to a podcast version of this episode, head over to servicedesignshow.com slash podcast, where you'll find this episode and all the previous ones. For now, let's just jump right in. Welcome to the show, Hartmut. Yeah, nice to see you. Great, great to have you on the show. And, uh, during our pre-chat for this episode, we talked a lot about uh, a lot of things, but we didn't actually talk about uh, the moment that you actually uh, got in touch with service design, or maybe even more interesting in your case, design in general. Do you remember the very first time that you got in touch with design? <laughs> yes, I think I was five years old, <laughs> uh, 1949. My dad got a Volkswagen Beetle. Yeah. And uh, I thought, it could, I always thought uh, some, there were some bad parts on it. <laughs> um, so I always designed another Volkswagen Beetle day and night. You were upgrading it. Yeah, and motorcycles. I mean, there were not many cars back then, I can imagine. We had the only car in the village, and then over time, uh, yeah, I think design by itself. Uh, was not so clear back then because in post-Nazi Germany, there was not much of a cultural recording of what the Bauhaus mm. had done, what uh, what Raymond Lowy had done in America. And so, but I always liked shapes, I always liked stuff. I always took everything apart uh, to the chagrin of my parents. <laughs> uh, my teacher, I was the village school, uh, let me do things I wanted to do. It was interesting, you had to get good grades. That you could do what you wanted to do, and then they build a fire truck, a small mm. one, mm. out of wood and bark, and because we had this fire pump, uh, I mean, this were only six, seven houses, you know, mm. crazy. And some mm. of the kids came from another village, and so um, that just kept kept me going. Mm. Um, and, and do you remember the moment that you actually start to realize that what you were doing had a name that it was that you could yeah, name it design? It was, it, it, yeah, I went the normal way. I did my uh, baccalaureate. I went to the army as a volunteer, became officer in the technical support troops. Actually, I was in Aachen at the yeah. office school. Yeah. Then uh, I started engineering because the service in the German army gave you one year university for free. So it already counted. So uh, I started in Stuttgart. And then my professor one day told me that, Esslinger, what you do is crazy. <laughs> uh, it's, everything is so complicated. You are never happy with the task. You always do something else. Uh, there's actually a job maybe for you. Look at it. 
uh, there is some design presentation. It's called Industrial Design. The guy from Ulm comes by, HFG in Ulm. And uh, when I saw what he showed, and I thought, that's easy. <laughs> uh, that's easy. So uh, that was a Saturday night. And then on Tuesday, I switched schools. I went to Schwäbisch Gmünd. <laughs> Uh, the guys at Ulm didn't take me because my sketches were too American. Mm. Uh, mm. And then Carl Dinnert, my professor, really was a fantastic teacher. Mm. But I didn't really know that it was called design until that moment when I got into that uh, that evening presentation. Mm. Mm. And that, 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 changed, that evening changed your life. Yeah, actually, I discovered what I really wanted to do. Yeah, And... Uh, since that day, I'm happy. Mm, mm, mm. Even if it's stress, I'm happy. <laughs> this is the most wonderful uh, profession on earth, mm, at least mm. for people like me. Mm. And it's uh, great to see that design has gotten at least some appreciation throughout the years, right? Yeah, the point was back then it was really um, uh, not widely recognized. Mm. Uh, design was more beautification. I mean, I studied electronics, so I looked at uh, the inside of the manufacturing process and the fine. So I said, form follows the motion, but the function has to be perfect. Yeah. And so actually, I can say by accident that I met the Damota at Vega. Uh, so we designed things from the inside out and for better assembly. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, look, I have an idea back then, everything was in a wooden cabinet. Or in a sheet metal cabinet like the brawn, but it was not made for assembly. Mm. So the worker at the at the production unit could not handle it. Mm. And so what we did, uh, I looked how the people worked on the assembly, and then I made the pieces in a sequence, and they would put them together in a logical way, and also easy for service and replacement. Mm. So subconsciously, when you talk sustainable design. These things were infinitely repairable, mm. exchangeable, and upgradable. Really. You were doing user research without actually knowing that you were doing user research, I guess. Yeah, there's a lot about etiquette, you know. Mm. Mm. Uh, design is basically very simple. Whether it's communication or products or digital or other services, you look at what is available in terms of technology and processes, and you look what pe look at people, and then it must make functional, emotional, and economic sense. And also, how, what are the resources you are using towards uh, the result for people? Mm. And uh, I mean, a famous example I was involved was Sherman Airlines Lufthansa. That was a service design job in the first place, but it also was a product which had to enhance the service. Mm. For example, they never thought that buying the ticket is the start of a process. They only looked at when the passenger is entering the airplane and leaving the tube mm -hmm. and nothing mm -hmm. between. So we had to redesign the Frankfurt Airport as a, as a benchmark mm -hmm. and also some details that people try to steal stuff, you know, <laughs> yeah. those uh, trick criminals flying in. And um, so we made the counters in a way that you cannot reach down. Mm -hmm. uh, we kept so we got the customer close, closer, but also at more a distance, so mm -hmm. protect the uh, thing. Also, the people sitting on the counter. I mean, for them, it's a stressful job. They meet about a thousand people during a shift. You mentioned everybody a ticket for mom, yeah. passport. Yeah. Is that? Oh, I don't like it. I'm late. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I don't have it. And so it's we the have the employee experience in that case. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so yes, it's some signage to educate passengers mm. how to behave more efficient and still have more fun. And so, so that was basically combination, mm. but we still had to make it economically sound. But it also could be impl implemented in Brazil or in Japan, wherever Lufthansa had a, had a, a physical mm. presence, and also then train the people accordingly. Because in Japan, people always, in China, people say, I don't know. <laughs> but for Lufthansa, they had to know. <laughs> and this is, for example, so we had to train them. <laughs> uh, we also had, for example, a thing we gave passengers back then, it was still uh, the Deutschmarks, I think, I forgot. 
maybe it was euro. You gave him a 20 euro bill. Yeah. And the passengers this morning, the plane would give the money to the flight attendant. And then the flight attendant said, what is that? Mm. And I said, oh, they protested. This was degrading. And then we explained to them, just to make sure who is paying you is a passenger. Yeah. It's creating awareness. Yeah. 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 And then they liked it. So mm. this one action helped across the company to explain, yeah, passengers paying awesome. us. Oh, it's, yeah. it's like that. Hartmut, um, I know we can talk all day about these kind of examples and you, your history is so rich that uh, it's so inspiring for everyone. But I ask you to send me two topics that are dear to your heart at this moment and let's use the time we have in this episode to talk about them and uh, time will fly by. So yeah. uh, let's see uh, how it goes. And I'm going to start, I don't know if you had a specific order, but we didn't discuss it. So I'll just pick this one as the first. And the first topic you wanted to talk about was co-design. Do you have a question starter, one of the papers on your desk that goes along with this one? Actually, what if? Yeah. What if co-design? What if people would learn in school to express themselves instead of just repeating uh, dead metal? Hmm. So instead I mean, of making people, uh, educating people to work in a factory, actually educate them in a way that they are ready for society. <laughs> no, no, for example, you do math. So why is one plus one two? And why is one to one plus one not 11? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, think a little bit more like Zen. Mm. Uh, deeper questions. And also accept that uh, you know, children very quick have a very good uh, point about what is good, what is not good, most at least. And so enhance uh, the, the, the courage to, to be more yourself mm. instead of always adopting. You know, there's famous examples that they bring people in and show them wrong things. It's very clear two things are equal size. And then the five people say, they are uneven, and then the, uh, I think most of the people say it's uneven. And you don't believe why they would do that. It's all even. Mm -hmm. You know, things like that. Or is it blue or, blue or red? And they say it's blue, even if they see it's red. So people uh, have to look what it really it is. And um, I think that would help. Uh, Co-design means to awaken a little bit this uh, ability of people to know what is right, to express more what they would like to do if they would only dare to think about it. Um, I mean, like products, for example, uh, we had a, a Disney project and a boy uh, said to Bill Gates, I want to switch, uh, this thing is too complicated. I want to switch from music to movies to computer. And then Bill Gates said, no, that is impossible. And then looking back then, it, at least it was it's a little boy, six years, said, aren't you the richest man on earth? <laughs> <laughs> and cannot give me a button. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. he said, it's so logical, so logical. Mm. Or, uh, I mean, uh, I think also it's about observing people. For example, uh, I think this whole idea of customer feedback is completely misunderstood. Uh, what you have to do, and I wouldn't call it research, I would call mm -hmm. it uh, pre-design, whatever. This leads to co-design. You exchange ideas with people in an active way, like we do. You don't need to be the end person. Just uh, send me a video of what you do. Mm -hmm. and what really bothers you. Or what would you think? And people have cool ideas. Mm -hmm. It's, they don't know how to do it, but they have the idea. So that would be a cool thing. So, and, and, and the, the reason why you're saying that customer feedback is being used wrong at this moment is that it's just a one-way street. There is no yes. dialogue. There is no continuity is, in it. It, it. it is to confirm what you already want to know. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it, it, the point is uh, statistically, and my wife is in that, as I told you, so she educated me a lot on that. But we do it somehow. Uh, of new products launched to market, only one is successful. And 95% of market research is for nothing. Mm. It's, a, it's a failure. Mm. Because 
Um, you just confirm what people have known from the past, but you cannot project what they really would love if it would be possible. This is like when Steve uh, finally did the iPhone. And we have this idea already 30 years back in 80, 82. So what if the Macintosh, what if the Macintosh would be just a tablet? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And everything in it and a display and nothing else. It would be cool. Mm. So it took a while. <laughs> and then um, what we got there. And then the next point was uh, the other people like Nokia and Samsung and Motorola and all of these guys said it doesn't make sense because people want a flip phone, they want the buttons, Blackberry, you know, they want battery life forever. And at Apple, nobody cared. They said we want to have a Macintosh in the pocket. Mm -hmm. So it was a change of paradigm. Mm -hmm. And uh, but then when we talked to people, everybody agreed. A Mac in the pocket would be great. You know, how do you name it? Mm -hmm. A cell phone in the pocket. Yeah, I have one. <laughs> it was the added ability that what the Mac would do, bring it to the into the pocket. Is there is the key element uh, in co-design that you need to bring your own perspective and you have to show leadership and th those are qualities that are not being thought enough at this moment? Yeah, I think most designers and most developers suffer from falling in love with their own idea mm -hmm. and then they try forever to prove it. Mm. And uh, co-design means whatever you to get very uneasy messages, but they're not. They're only uneasy because they're new. And they're yeah. requesting something that you get a bit beyond what you have learned so far and have done. So ideally, when people have the most, uh, it's not about creativity. That's another thing. You know, to be creative, it's only one in eight. But everybody can say what they would like to have: the happiness, good life. This magical machines, a car which drives itself. I mean, it's logical. If mm. you look at old literature, the Gilgamesh and so on, it's all there. Or this is this self-driving toilet? So uh, my students ask people when around, and they ask people about the toilet, the public toilet, which is a problem in China everywhere and everywhere. So they just analyzed the. Uh, uh, people got there, stood in line, and the, the male was okay, the female was almost too small, and the lady stood in line. And then um, one guy uh, said in the line, why doesn't the toilet come to me? Hmm. That would be hmm. cool. Hmm. You know, this, this guy said, the why, why doesn't the toilet come to me? Hmm. And then she was self-driving and uh, Michael Hoffman's uh, Bill Gates' toilet and everything. So yeah, could be. Hmm. You made an app, you design it, and everybody loves it. And says, oh, wow, it's so logical. Hmm. But it was a man in the line. Said, so why not? You know, hmm. what if? What, what if it came to me? So, so is that the question? What if? Is yeah. It, what if? Should Should we be asking more what if questions? Yeah, that's the key question. Uh -huh. It's not the why. Uh, why do we do this? This is all European. Uh, it's, uh, it's 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 like stupid, you know. Mm. Mm. Why am I doing this? It's, it's it's crazy. Why am I doing it? But what if? Mm. It's better. What if sparks imagination? I guess right. It 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 gets people excited. Yeah, I mean that's the next step for designers uh, that you can imagine what it could be. Mm. And then you're, painting a, you're painting a future, right? You're painting a picture of a future that might be. Uh, yeah, and, and also I think what we designers have to do is a lot of simulation. For example, it's, it's actually more than 10 years ago, it is a computer which would be a tattoo on the head, kind of a put on, living off the uh, glucose in the body and have movies playing on the skin. Uh, because that's completely crazy. But uh, I said, what if it, uh, technology yeah. already is yeah. it? And that feels, yeah, it would be really cool. I mean, you can wash it off in a shower. Um, different designs in a computer, mm -hmm. print it out, get it. Mm -hmm. There's nothing impossible when you, you can imagine everything. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> let's, let's 
uh, let's move on to the second topic, Hartmut, because I think that's the one you also like to talk about and it's dear to your heart at this moment. And you sort of already hinted upon this one. Uh, this one is about sustainable design or yeah. modularity. Do you have a question starter? Let's, let's co-design the question. Yeah, actually, uh, how, how can we get there, yes? How can we get to sustainable design or to modularity or? Yeah, actually, it's, it's two, it's, uh, two things. Uh, one is the modular, the modular concept. You know, each product with some complexity has different components and they have different uh, life cycles. Take a refrigerator in my kitchen. It has a housing. The housing can live for a hundred years. Mm. There's a compressor here on the inside. So currently it's not separatable. And when we move back to the house, we rebuild it. Then we had to, the other one didn't match. So we sold it and uh, somebody took it. It's always a fixed element, but the functionality of it is so different. So one um, project we do in China is a, refrigerator, which is adaptive to local food culture, mm. more vegetable, more beef, more fish, either in the north more beef, in the south more veggies, and veggies area, but also fish in, in the south, which is very perishable. Also shopping patterns, because uh, people have to walk, they don't have, it's, it's uh, China isn't working like here that you drive to the supermarket. Uh, you have to do, if you have to go public, Transport, there's no parking, so you have the public transport and walk. So we also designed a shopping cart which can be taken home. Mm. It has a cooling function in it because if you go to Fushangai or Beijing or Xi'an and a huge temperature, everything melts off. Um, so uh, we do a modular concept which then allows people to adjust to their liking. For vegetarians, don't need the beef compartments, mm. you know. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. So also some intelligence in it that it gives you advice what to buy when. And normally, um, this is a, this is one example. The other one displays. I'm a computer here, so I have seven Macs at least in my closet. Each has a digital display. I mean, you can watch TV, but it or whatever media's movies, but it's fro de facto mm. thrown away. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, modularity would mean that on the iPhone here, um, so I just would put in a new chip and it's upgraded. So Maybe more mem memory. Why do I have to throw away the whole thing? And Apple could charge me three hundred forty bucks for this thing. Oh. Would be even more profitable instead of this whole ecological nightmare of throwing hundreds of millions of phones away every year. You, you're the. Uh interesting article on your blog. I will link to it in, uh, in the description. And I sort of got the idea through the blog that uh, we, we used to design for modularity and more sustainability, your example yeah. of, the, of the beetle. Yeah. And somehow we lost that along the way. What happened? Correct. What, what ha why did, where did we lose it? I think one, I mean, the, both the beetle and actually also the old uh, Ford T model, the Lizzie, and especially the Deux Chevaux in France, were very modular. Everything mm -hmm. could be replaced in a very short time. And uh, so it were really smart concepts. But actually they were limiting the design a little bit, but there is no reason with modern production methods to be more modular in the automotive, uh, in the automotive thing. Then comes the idea, of crash testing also acceptable, even that could be modules, you know. The excuse people use, yes, uh, we have to run the business, we have to sell new cars, we have to sell new refrigerators, mm. new, new iPhones, new computers. So there's a lot of artificial obsolescence in there. And naturally it's easier to sell a closed concept to somebody. It's mm. just the product, bang, bang, so much money. And with a, yeah, it's really addiction to cheapness, you know, get it cheaper, 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 instead of the right thing. Mm -hmm. It's not about price, it's about the right thing, which has a long life cycle. And then the different life cycles of components, is that a display in a computer can live 10 years, theoretically, the processor 18 months. So why not the battery also gets kind of tired over time? 
and then just change the components which have a shorter life cycle or a shorter innovation cycle. But the rest could stay. So it, your, your point is also that we, we, there is no other way. We need more sustainable design. Otherwise, we'll sort of kill ourselves and kill the planet. You know, from your perspective, what, what will be the driving forces that actually move us more into sustainable design? Will it be the, the large corporations? Will it be the government? Will it be education? Where, what will lead this? I, I think one uh, more the economic thing is design a modular product which convinces by being more valuable mm -hmm. and also providing more usage and fun and, and a better fulfillment of the product promise. But I think then you hopefully win over those with the old-fashioned uh, concept. But you, I think we also need a political uh, help. For example, in Germany right now, they have finally decided to ban diesel engines from the downtown because of the PM 2.5. Uh, same in China, they will ban gasoline-driven fossil fuel out of cities within the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. Downtown Shanghai already is redesigned for electric and fuel cell. And uh, so I think we also need the political will. Yeah. Because the, uh, people are dying from this yeah, craziness. Yeah. You know? yeah. Also, I, what, uh, for example, in, in China, when you fly to Mongolia, there are craters in the town there, four or five miles wide, and they dig for the teledyne, which is actually used in our displays. So, I mean, it's, it's nearly a kilometer deep, huge. One day it's gone, mm. you know? Mm. Mm. You see these holes, uh, you have to recycle, so also design for recycling. Mm. But I think the better way, for, instead of design for recycling, is to design for reuse. Yeah. yeah. Make it usable again. Are you hopeful that we'll succeed? Do you have any clues that we are actually going to get there? I mean, one thing was... Uh, yeah, I think human people need a crisis. Mm. Only then they are willing to rethink in the big number. Uh, in the beginning, when I worked with Apple and Steve, I said no paint because I'd seen at Sony what the paint is doing. I mean, this metallic stuff, whatever, and the plastic cannot be recycled, and it's even not that good looking. So I said, why don't we look the best plastic, which is actually four times the price than the current plastic. But it's only from one dollar to four dollars mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the computer. And then you don't pay it. And I said, one day we make a million computers, and I showed him a picture of how much spray mm -hmm. they would put on. Mm. But I said, if it looks right, why not? You know? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, we, also, we designers have to convince people with a positive argument that what we do will be much more, will be better, not only for the a recycling element or whatever, yeah. but also for the daily use. Yeah. It doesn't scratch off, you know, because there's no paint. Yeah. And uh, then the, 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 the chemical industry, with Apple pulled, they gave us always better GE, mm. gave us better, better plastic. Mm. So, so again, my, my question, are you hopeful? Do you think? No, I'm a skeptic. <laughs> I'm an optimistic skeptic, <laughs> but I don't give in. <laughs> we, I mean, we, the problem is, I'm now over 70, and you think, okay, we changed a lot, we achieved a lot, but in the end, uh, there's also the counter movement yeah. of uh, non creative, senseless waste, and actually, I think also uneducated, naive, and stupid consumption. That's our enemy. I think it's human behavior. If people would refuse, to buy it because of certain things, that would be helpful. Mm. So I think if you, if you speak of services and communication, you also have to look what are people doing with it, you know? Mm. And, and I think this is a very nice sort of bridge to the question I wanted to ask you, and that is there are millions of people watching this episode probably, hopefully. And this is your chance to ask them a question. What would you like to ask the viewers or the listeners of this episode? Yeah, um, yeah my grandfather was from the North Sea. And he said, whenever you do something, first put your tongue up, count to five or to ten, and then be very careful what you say. I think the same applies to buying. 
uh, before you get uh, pulled away, I, I need this, I want it. Do you really need it? Do you, th do you really understand what it could be? Uh, isn't there a better way? Think about it. Hmm. So, uh, yeah. Before you actually buy more stuff, buy yeah. more consciously. Oh, for example, even with Apple, a lot of his calls. So why do people have an iWatch? They have to shake it. And so this, sometimes, um, it gets a little bit of drift, you know. Hmm. But why you could do it in your car? But they have a Porsche, luckily. So they'll constantly bombard me. Why don't you buy a new one? I drive my Porsches 10 to 20 years. I'm now at year 10. <laughs> That's fine. The car and it looks still drives. Good. Yeah, sure, it does. It drives well. I don't need the new stuff, you know. Yeah. But the point is, by servicing it and, and keeping it well maintained, a Porsche, the local shop makes good money with me. I, I, I guess we also need companies that sort of take pride in making more sustainable stuff, right? And, and yeah. they, they, they use that argument and, and, and actually are proud of the fact that they are making stuff that doesn't need to be replaced in the next five months. Or, or one or two years, yes. Yeah. Then it's also with mobility. The, I mean, you also have a scandal in Germany right now, but it's everywhere. So the government requested, yeah, they have to reduce uh, emission, then they started to cheat instead of solving it or telling the government it doesn't work. Mm. You know, uh, I don't know whether it's the right thing here, but maybe it helps. Um, there's this funny story, and not funny, in Black Forest, where I'm from and grew up. And so the two neighbors, two farmers, have each has a goat. And the goat gives milk. And the one is kind of a stingy guy, and then he stops to give uh, to feed the goat. And the goat starts to scream and, and whine, still gives milk. So over the, over the days, the other guy, the neighbor said, Oh, your goat still giving milk, but it's pretty nasty. I mean, she's screaming like crazy. Finally, on Saturday, the goat is quiet. And then the neighbor said, congrats. She finally, it works, right? He said, yes, just when she accepted to give milk without food, she died. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the economic problem mm. of so many companies. Mm. Mm. They try to squeeze to the last thing. And then they wonder why are people, why is it collapsing, you know? Mm. We'll do a different episode on, uh, on that topic in, in general. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Hartmut, thank you so much for your time. Uh, this, this was all the time we had for in this interview. It's time to wrap up. And again, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for, for sharing your thoughts. Yeah, and you mentioned, Mark, that millions would watch it. I think it's good enough when 100 who watch it change the attitude and become a little bit more aware of what they what the effects of the work we have to be more positive okay absolutely thank you absolutely. thank you so what is your biggest insight based on what we've just discussed with Hartmut is sustainability an important argument in your design process let us know down below in the comments and remember more people like you are watching these episodes and your comment might just be the thing that helps them to get the next meaningful breakthrough. If you're interested in learning more, check out some of the past episodes or head over to learn.servicedesignshow.com where you'll find courses that dig deeper into the topics we talk about on the show. I'll see you in two weeks time with a brand new episode. Thanks for watching and I'll see you then.